kind birthday wishes, the generous gifts, um, and the other barbs that have been thrown and tossed. They're not lost on me, Brother Ash. All right, I see my hearing is still just fine, as good as it was yesterday, and I did not miss the many, many years. I caught that. I caught that. Double honor. Double honor. He wants to play. He wants to play. And... <laughs> There's not enough time. No, no, no. Brother Ash is a dear friend. In fact, um, he and I had the privilege of living together uh, when they, he first came to Michigan. I bought a house. First house I bought, he and I were roommates and just a dear friend. Owned Brother Ash for a long, long time. And uh, even he won't escape the wrath. No, no. But I appreciate, appreciate that very much. And I, apparently I'm told, um, and this is true, I am told, I did not orchestrate this, but there is a reception or a, some cake and ice cream after I get done preaching. And so seeing that I love cake and ice cream, I'm going to be about done and so we'll make it real simple. Okay, I'm just going gonna, gonna to read the scripture. I'm going to ask for an invitation, and you respond. And if it's not good enough, I'll, I'll preach some more, and we'll keep on going until... No, no. And, uh, but I appreciate the, all the kindness. Thank you. It is an honor and privilege to be here at First Baptist Church, and friends and family, and, and love being here. My wife, my family, and I am particularly honored to be here. So thank you for that. And um, one more year serving God. Romans chapter 1 tonight, as we look at this passage, we looked at it briefly this morning... A little different application night from this passage. A passage we've looked at before in this series on living the gospel. And don't worry, at some point between now and 2023, I'll be pick up Colossians and finish that up. So don't worry, but there are so many passages that particularly are, have an emphasis about this concept of living the gospel. I was challenged, and we'll look at this passage in light of some things from the writer, the Apostle Paul, and just in light of current events. And how I believe this particular message, the message living the gospel, is as necessary now as it ever has been. And 2022 is necessary now in America as it ever has been. It seems, from a limited observation, from my perspective, that, that we are not, as a nation, becoming more spiritual. I mean, would you not agree with me? We don't wake up, turn the news, and be like, wow, we're even more of a Christian nation than we were yesterday and last year. And unfortunately, it doesn't stop just in the nation, but even individually, it seems that, and this is what the Bible says would happen in the last days, that these things would, would be less and less. The commitment and discipleship and the love for Jesus Christ would grow less and less, so it would not grow greater and greater. And so this message of all time periods is particularly helpful in 2022. If the Lord tarries, it'll be even more emphatic in 2023, but until Jesus Christ decides to call us home, right? we must strive to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a current trend in the preaching that I admit is, is tempting because people enjoy it and it's more of a psychological approach to preaching. Let me give you some self-help, the five ways to maintain your marriage or when you're down and out and I absolutely agree the Bible does deal with these things, and I will bring those inside of series. But the Bible is not merely a self-help book. The Bible is the inspired word of God from cover to cover. And all of it is profitable for doctrine, all right, the teaching to know God, for reproof, all right, for the, the instruction for me, for correction, to slap me upside the head, instruction righteous, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Yet the Bible warns us in the last days there'll be people with itching ears. They just want their ears to be tickled by a brand new concept or something that makes me feel warm and fuzzy. And we see this all around us if you look every day of the week. I mentioned in our business meeting how that our because of your generosity and the gifts, our impact in a social setting or in a media sense is greater than it has been in previous years. But if you look, some of the most popular videos, Christian videos, would not be biblically sound videos in Christian videos. If you looked at the most popular preachers on YouTube, they would not be biblically sound to those who would preach the Word of God. In fact, at times, if you listen to them preach, it is exactly contrary to the Word of God. Exactly opposite of the word of God. And people will flock to hear them. Flock to hear them. And yet we are called today, just like when Jesus gave these words to his disciples in the Gospels and Paul wrote to the Romans, we are called to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my prayer, all right, my 
If I can, my goal, my aim for this year is to challenge myself. As I preach, I preach to myself first and to you to live the gospel this year. So that maybe in Saginaw, Michigan, in Bridgeport, Michigan, in Burst Run, in Frankenmuth, in Saginaw Township, in Burt, wherever you may reside, wherever your house may be, that may be right there, you will be the light that God has called you to be. And I will be the light that God has called me to be so that others may see that light and glorify their Father which is in heaven. This is living the gospel. It's not about just showing up at church, though you ought to be in church. It's about living the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1, Paul has a desire to be at Rome. He has a desire to go to Rome. In verse number 11, he says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. In the end, you may be established. Verse 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. Said I couldn't come. Verse 15, so as much as it, as it in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. In verse 16, our text for tonight, which is this morning, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That phrase, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ this morning, specifically with the application that sometimes there are, there are those who are ashamed to accept the gospel. That word ashamed means to be embarrassed or to be reluctant. And we ought not to have any shame, any embarrassment, any reluctance in accepting the gospel. I challenged this morning, and I know that when I preach at First Baptist Church and preach on the gospel, I realize that many have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But I'm not convinced that all have. And you may be here, you could be here this morning, you could be serving in this church for years. And if you've never accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, do not allow fear to embarrass you from accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be ashamed of the gospel. Do not allow something to hinder you. Fear of judgment, what will they say? You know what people will say? Praise God. They'll say, praise God. In fact, I heard a couple of different particular stories this morning about those who have trusted Jesus Christ who were members here and who, who everyone would have thought maybe they knew God, but this is, this is the gospel. Again, encourage me, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, then accept him tonight. You say, well, well, pastor, what will people think? They'll be glad. They'll be glad. What, what will the other deacons think? Well, all the deacons probably ought to get saved, right? No, no, no. They're blessed with, with wonderful deacons, right? Well, they'll be glad. They'll be glad. What will my class think that I teach? They'll, they'll be glad. They'll be thankful. What will my husband think? What will my wife think? What will my parents think? What will my children think? They'll be glad that you responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And wouldn't it be a shame for someone to have been under the ministry of Pastor Latin, now here at First Baptist Church, under the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is the gospel preaching ministry. Right? We don't hide the gospel here. But wouldn't it be a shame to be and go through this ministry and be a part of this ministry and not accept the gospel of Jesus Christ? Tonight I want to give us a little different emphasis if I can. Where Paul challenges again in a more particular way where he says and he proclaims of his own life, of his own ministry, of his own integrity and character, of his own dedication. He says to the Romans and to all, for all, he proclaims and loudly proclaims, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He who chased those who proclaimed the gospel of Christ was now not ashamed to proclaim it, not ashamed to be labeled by his proclamation, not ashamed to suffer the consequences of his decision to follow Jesus Christ for all to know, for all to hear. And in Rome saying, I am not ashamed. Knowing full well this message would be proclaimed about, this message would be read about to other Christians. Knowing that word would get about, Paul is not ashamed. It was no secret that Paul was a gospel preacher and a gospel liver. Throughout the New Testament, we see the words of Paul, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We see the stories of Paul, particularly in Acts. And the things that he walked through that God allowed in his life for the sake of the gospel. 
His entire life was lived, it appeared, at, after his conversion for the gospel. And many things happened that we would say were bad for the gospel. There were people set to kill him because of the gospel. There were cities turned against him because of the gospel. He was in a shipwreck because of the gospel. He was beaten multiple times because of the gospel, in bondage because of the gospel, and yet he proclaims, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Tonight the question is simple. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you embarrassed by it? Or are you reluctant to live by it? We mistakenly, and some mistakenly think, that being offensive is the biggest issue. I don't want to offend anybody with the gospel. That's their greatest mantra. There are whole ministries that subscribe to this idea, this philosophy, that makes sure that when we speak that we are not offensive, we don't offend someone. Now, I believe that we should not be offensive just to be offensive. There are those out there who claim the name of Jesus who are offensive just to be offensive. And they, and they don't, I believe, they don't know the message of Jesus Christ. They, they, they may have heard it, but they don't know it. If you believe the message of Jesus Christ, he was not offensive just to be offensive. There are those at times who would claim the name of Jesus, claim the name of Baptist, and they would, they would stand at funerals and pick it. That is not part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of some of those poor examples, hypocrites if I may, there's been a strong movement to back away and say, well, we can't be offensive. And so we can't use words like hell, suffering, condemnation or damnation. Though those are Bible words found in Scripture, we cannot use those words. We must make sure we just use words like forgiveness and mercy and love, which are also Bible words. But being offensive is not the biggest issue. They are concerned about being offensive here, but missing the point that they're offensive here. When Jesus was offensive, when those people got mad at him, it was not because of his attitude, but it was because of his message. And if we are to offend, it must not be because of our attitude, it must be because of our message. And if someone is offended because God loves them and Jesus died for them, he's the only way to heaven, then so be it. Yet some are embarrassed by the gospel because of the gospel's message. There are some who will not declare that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven because they're ashamed of that message. And when pressed, and you can find these even, even well-known speakers and well-known so-called preachers, so-called preachers, when pressed upon the issue, is Jesus the only way to heaven, will dance around the issue. My friend, in case you're wondering, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus said that, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he clarifies, in case you missed it, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If that offends your religion, I'm sorry, but Jesus is the only way to heaven, the only way. There are many ways that lead to a future, but only one way that leads to the Father. Yet besides that, we're reluctant to live the gospel, we're seeing the gospel because we sometimes don't want to give up our false sense of security and control. We're ashamed to live the gospel because we think we are running our own lives. We think that we have life figured out. And by our rational thinking, and this crept into Christendom many, many, hundreds of years ago, this rationalism that, that what really determines life is my rational thoughts. Now understand that we were created by a rational creator to be rational beings, and we read a rational word, but we do not live by rationalism, we, we live by faith. I mean, when God created the world, he created something with order and purpose, not just chaos. I mean, your thumbs bend a certain way, your elbows bend a certain way, and it works together. That's rational. It makes sense together. 
But God did not make, us, make this world just so it all makes sense. He made us to walk by faith. And some are reluctant to live the gospel. They're ashamed of the gospel because of their own sense, their false sense of security and control. We'll hide the gospel message. We don't want others to know we're Christian. They shouldn't know we're Christian by the way we dress. We must conceal that fact. We must conceal that. Got a little quiet in here. Heaven forbid that someone would say, boy, what's wrong with you? Heaven forbid that someone would notice that maybe we're a little bit different, though Jesus has called us to be different. We're ashamed of the gospel. There are Christians who try to conceal every difference that they have in philosophy, dress, ideology, to, quote, be like everybody else. And then claim that by doing that, by concealing Jesus Christ, we'll win more to Christ. Now think about that thought process. If I hide Jesus, if I hide what he's done in my life, then more people will know about him. Does that make sense to you? Help me here. Does that make sense to you? No, it doesn't make sense. Again, Jesus did not call us to be offensive, but he said, you are salt. You are the salt of not just your neighborhood, but of the earth. You are the light in a city set on a hill. You cannot be hid. Yet, there are Christians who are ashamed of the gospel. There are teenagers who are ashamed of the gospel. Heaven forbid that someone know that you love Jesus Christ. Well, why do you do that? Well, uh, um, 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 ashamed of the gospel. There are men in this room who work, have co-workers who are unsaved, and when pressed about what your belief is, ah, well, ah, 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 and then your mind, well, I just don't want to talk about Jesus. Well, why not? That's what Paul is saying. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You can know who I am. Paul says you can know what I believe. You can know in whom I believe. I'm proud. I'm proudly proclaiming the fact I'm a Christian. I don't deserve to be one. All I've done is trust in Jesus Christ, but I will not shy away from it. I will not hide behind that fact. I am a Christian. There are times that we sit down to eat with those who haven't called the name of Jesus. And they perhaps order things that would not be fitting in a Christian's life, alcohol, things like that. The Bible teaches clearly against. But the Bible teaches clearly against Aren't you going to drink? Ah, no, 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 it's not good for my diet. Rather than, listen, I believe that my God doesn't want me to. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Not the fact that you're slapping their cup of beer across the table. But you say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed. You play some travel sports. You're aware of my kids do. We've tried not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't play. We have church. You've heard. We have a, they've said this. You have a lot of church. True. <laughs> we got a lot of church. We got a lot of church. But you know what? I like being in church. I like being in church. I like being in church among the people of God and the house of God, worshiping God. I like being in church. Sure, there's sometimes I wake up Sunday afternoon, I'm like, boy, I'm tired tonight. Anybody else with me? Come on, oh, come on, you bunch of pagans. Anybody else with me on a Sunday night, you're like, boy, I'm tired. But you know what? I'm glad. Thank you. But I have some honest people in here. There are times I wake up, I'm like, boy, I'm still tired. And given the opportunity, I sleep through the rest of the night. Given the opportunity, it's been a long day. You know what? No one was nice to me. My wife didn't like my sermon. What's a long day? I'm staying home tonight. You know, all right, honey, get out of bed, she says. We got a lot of church, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm going somewhere tonight. Long introduction. We'll get, we'll get cake and ice cream, I promise you. I promise you. Before my next birthday, that's for sure. I found this interesting last thought before we jump in here. It was a notice about how the church has, the 19th, 20th century, the church has been distracted, been distracted. 
They gave a couple of distractions in the article that I read, and it was a very intriguing article. They first mentioned that the church became increasingly fascinated with government and the political power. And many Christians became convinced that the best way to influence the world was through civil action and social activism. Now, we ought to be involved. You ought to vote. All right, you ought to vote. You ought to be involved. But they wanted to say that whether the issue was prohibition, prayer in school, or conservatism, millions of man hours and billions of dollars have been spent attempting to legislate morality. But then they made this comment that really struck me right here. They said, but the church has forgotten the fact that our primary purpose on earth is not political but redemptive. We will not save America by electing the right people, though we ought to elect the right people. America will be saved by the power of the gospel. And it ought to be lived by the people of God. You become distracted by political gain. You become distracted by pragmatism. What works? Unfortunately, there are many churches stuck inside of this pragmatic philosophy. All of us are pragmatic to a, to, to a degree. All of us do things that work in general, right? I mean, if you're going to fix something, you want to fix it the way that it works. But when we come to church, our highest priority is not just pragmatism, what brings people here, but what pleases God. Living the gospel, the highest priority is not what necessarily makes sense or what works, but what pleases God. And yet Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This afternoon, I went up and spent some time with Brother Lee Edwards. I mentioned this morning he's not doing well and not sure where it's at right now. Could have, at some point, today or tomorrow, he most likely will pass to glory. He'll be with Carol Lee. He'll be with Jesus. He's told me multiple times the last few months. He said, Pastor, I'm ready to see Jesus. I'm ready to see Carol Lee. But then he says this almost every time, but I'll stay here as long as Jesus wants me here. A man who I admire, who I respect but a man who I can clearly say lived the gospel of Jesus Christ. The night as I was studying again, could not help but have my thoughts turned back to Lee Edwards, and I know I'm working through this certain point. I'll get there. But thinking about Lee Edwards made me realize again the necessity of not being ashamed of the gospel. I got the chance to spend not as much as some, but hours with this man, hear stories. Lord blessed him financially, blessed him tremendously with a, with a tremendous brain. Smart, smart. In fact, part of the reason I'm in the stock market now is because of Lee Edwards and his training for me. I said, show me what you do when he's made some, some gains in the stock market. But Lee Edwards and Carol Lee Edwards both centered their life around Jesus Christ. If you knew them at all, if you knew their testimony at all, they centered their life around Jesus Christ. And they centered their life around a church because he thought going to church would please Jesus Christ. He was not ashamed of that. In his time at General Motors, he would tell the, the management, well, I will go there, but only if I can find a church first. Toward the end, he told me that they twice, that at the end of his career, at least twice, they said, Mr. Edwards, he said, that's what they called me. That's what he told me. He said, that's what they called Mr. Edwards. And Mr. Edwards, would you mind moving to such and such a state or to such, such and such a plant or state? And then he said, they said, oh, but Mr. Edwards, we know that you have to find a church first, so would you go there, and if you find a church, let us know so you can transfer over there. This is someone who's not ashamed of the gospel. Who was willing to risk career and life and all of that for the gospel's sake. I was at lunch with Mr. Edwards, Brother Edwards. He was kind of reminiscing about life. What he reminisced about was not the accomplishments not the security clearance, the highest in the country. Not the projects, the patents. But the people. The people that Christ allowed him to influence. And what he filled the stories at lunch that day with were the people that he was able to disciple with Kara Lee that are still living the gospel because of his influence, because of his testimony. A man who is not ashamed of the gospel. And my friend, if you and I, if you and I are going to have any impact in this world, we must not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Can you imagine if the Apostle Paul was ashamed? If he was, there would be no book of Romans. Book of Philippians or Ephesians. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friend, if you live the gospel, it could be lonely. In fact, when Jesus Christ went to the cross, all forsook him. Everyone who should have stood was ashamed. Everyone walked away. Everyone. Everyone. Yet, yet the mission of Jesus still went forward. And see, whether I go alone or we all go together, the mission of Jesus will still go forward. But our individual walk will be hindered. Their walk was hindered. Peter needed that restoration. He needed that other uh, time with Jesus Christ. Feed my sheep on the shore there. We can find forgiveness, but living the gospel could be lonely. There are those around you who ought to live the gospel who won't because they're embarrassed or reluctant. Press on. Live the gospel. Press on. Don't be ashamed. Press on with dependence upon Jesus Christ. Living the gospel could be dangerous. In this passage written to Rome, written around 57 A.D. That won't mean much to you until I explain that it was around 64 A.D. when they had the great fire of Rome where Nero blamed the Christians. Ten, seven to ten years later, 54 to 57, this book of Romans was, was written, about ten years later was when the persecution hit. Notice that Paul is saying here, I'm not ashamed, writing to Christians who were in relative freedom of their Christianity at that point, the ability to worship at that point, not realizing that in just a few short years, this message would become a whole lot more powerful in their life. And I think of our friends, fellow believers in the Ukraine, who when the Soviet Union pulled out, had freedom. And yet today the message is a lot different, is it not? We pray for them. Messages from a few missionaries. I don't have time to read them now. But they've said this is a spiritual fight. And they're not complaining. I mentioned this morning, they're not complaining. They're concerned. They don't be, appear to be ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> I wonder tonight... The Apostle Paul showed up tonight. First of all, he showed up, we let him preach. Would we not? Would we not let him preach? Yeah, now you say amen, but he preached so long, people fell asleep and fell out a window and died. So maybe somewhere in there you'd be thankful for me. Somewhere in there you'd be thankful for me. He's preaching along, right? But I wonder what Paul would say to us tonight, just from his heart. If he saw the current state of Christianity, what would he say? Maybe as he lifted up his shirt and showed some of the, <laughs> the places and the scars on his back. How he was not ashamed of the gospel. What would he say to us? If he went to work with you tomorrow, and he saw you interacting with co-workers who don't know Jesus Christ, what would he say? When you said, well, we don't understand, Paul. I mean, I, I don't, don't want them to get mad at me. When Paul says, well, let me tell you about the time that I'm holding on to a board. I'm holding on to a board, and I'm going to get to this island, and a snake's going to bite me on the arm. All right? And I'm going to preach the gospel, and you're worried about a coworker getting mad at you? I wonder if Paul would, as he turns away, say, but <laughs> I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I wonder what he'd say when he looked at your checkbook, your account. Sees what you do with your money all day, what you're worried about, how you live. You say, wow, you're really blessed. Wow, I hope you've learned to be content in, in all things. But you're not living for the gospel? I wonder, we say, well, well Paul, listen, I, I'm in church. We got a lot of church, Paul. We got a lot of church. A lot of church. We're there like three times a week, and then we got some other, like, we got bridge recovery, you know, and so we got chapel in the, in the high school every day, five days a week. Paul, we got a lot of church. But Paul say, 
Wow. And what do you say? And this, and this is your commitment. This is your commitment. This is your dedication. You see, when you say I'm not ashamed of the gospel, I'm not embarrassed or reluctant for the gospel. When God speaks, I respond. I wonder how many times God has spoken and we say, Lord, I can't do that. I wonder how many times we say, Lord, it's a gospel track. In our mind, we're ashamed. How many times we're prompted to say a word, to make a decision? It would be part of the gospel. And yet instead of living the gospel, we're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Very soon, if not already, Brother Edwards will be in glory. I don't know him as well as Jesus does, but I can imagine that Brother Edwards will probably receive the commendation, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We can have that same commendation. Not just for him, not just for Paul, not just for Peter. It can be for you and for me. But we won't if we're ashamed of the gospel. Tonight, simple. Don't be ashamed. Proclaim with Paul, I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not reluctant. You can know who I believe. You know what? You ought to trust him too.